no one would have conceived in the last years of the 20th century that an unregarded part of London's commuter belt would become a hotbed for progressive rock. Then, in 1989, Threshold emerged. Only was uh, friendly with Carl as well. When I first met Carl, going to a slave, he had that Hammersmithobian. They sort of jammed together in a band and um, it sort of inspired me to get a guitar and uh, join in. And uh, that, was, that was how it all really started, you know, just us messing about before we start getting gigs and pubs and things. I was introduced to Carl and Nick and Tony by a mutual friend and it all went on from there. Uh, the original lineup: um, Nick, myself, uh, John, Tony Grinham on drums, um, and Ian Bennett uh, playing bass. I said, "Well, you know, I can I can play bass because I've done it in uh, played bass in bands before, um, mostly blues bands. Um, I'd only ended up singing because I was the only one that you know cool enough to do it. So um, I started playing the bass and singing in the band. And that went on for about a year, and my singing suffered because. I was concentrating more on the bass, and uh, so when, when we did get eventually get a chance to record a record, uh, we decided it'd be best to get a proper singer in. So we drafted in Damien. I ran into Damien, funnily enough, only about a few months before we uh, sort of decided to do the first album. Um, he turned up with somebody else I was working with on some pop music. And uh, he just turned up with an acoustic guitar and a tambourine and started making a hell of a noise and singing at the top of his voice and telling me what a great vocalist he was. I was in a band with Carl in 91, 92 called Mercy Train. And I was the keyboard player, he was a guitarist. And he asked me to join another band, Shadowland. So I went out on tour with them. Miles away, he asked me to join another band, Threshold. So I thought, why not? However, it was soon necessary to find a new singer, Glyn Morgan. Damien got uh, offered quite a lucrative um, opportunity to go to California and join a band called La Salle. And, you know, uh, we could all understand why he wanted to do that. All we could offer him was a sort of uh, tour in a transit van rancher. <laughs> well, it's the good old time honoured tradition of an advert in Melbourne, I think. We just put an ad in the classified section to the music magazine. And he replied, we had some terrible responses. We had this woman who was singing death metal vocals and she really thought she'd fit in Threshold. And we've still got the tape, it's hilarious. I mean, if, if you're looking, if you're watching the video, you're a great singer really, but just not quite Threshold. <laughs> and we had, we had loads of candidates, we were quite surprised. And we were really worried because we were about to do our first tour and Damon had already gone. We had about three weeks to go and we couldn't choose because they were all okay, but they just weren't quite right and we managed to convince each other to wait one more week and we did and then the paper got through the post and we were just so relieved that's such a good thing and he looked at it as well he made us all look okay we got a call from MTV I think and they said they wanted a video because they liked the album we directed it ourselves and we filmed it some of it was in Carl's bedroom some of it was in a cafe down the road some of it was in a warehouse up in London that we found I'm not sure how much out my head to actually get them played on MTV anyway, so I think we came to that and we, we just did the kind of cable channel route with it and we had a few plays like that, but the, it, wasn't, it wasn't a great thing to do in the end because uh, I think at the time the main main thing we could have got it shown on would have been Headbangers Ball and, and that pretty much collapsed at the time and the show ended, so. You know, Glenn had his own ideas about what sort of music he wanted to do and I, I don't think that all the time it was necessarily the same as you know, the, the music we were doing. So it was time for him to go on and do Mindfeed, which has been really successful for him. So, you know, we're best of friends now where we meet, so it's all worked out okay. Well, it's quite a long time actually. He joined in 94, and then we did the album, that was in 94, followed by a live album in 95, and then he was with us for all the way through 96, we just didn't do very much. Damien was around and it seemed like great, you know, get the, get the old lineup back together again because um, we were concerned about too many lineup changes uh, in, in those early days, you know, we had um, drummers and vocalists coming and going. And so an another lineup change back to a, a, an older singer seemed like less of a problem. So along came Damien again. In, uh, 
this time we managed to convince him to come on tour with us, <laughs> which was a bonus too. So. At this time, Johan, Threshold's enigmatic drummer, was recruited. But disaster soon struck again. He had another opportunity to do something else which you know, he thought would be better, I think. So he did let us down at the last minute, actually. So it was a little bit, you know, more uh, acrimonious than that, I guess. But um, I mean, I for one uh, can see, see his reasons again, you know. Second time he left, um, I think he went off and did a Play Miserable musical, and and really the second time he got to the point where he hated doing any live shows with us, he just couldn't bear doing gigs. So I mean, he didn't have a choice with Damien. And then a week before playing, as most people know, he turned up and said that he wasn't going to do it. We were desperate because we'd already recorded the music. We just had the singer slot already, and he was supposed to come in, and suddenly we had no singer, so we didn't know anybody in England who was available. Actually, what was Thomas called from the record company, and they were looking for a singer. Thomas, for some reason, knew me from Sergeant Fury. Mm -hmm. Called Heigl, the drummer. He just happens to work. He was working for CMM at the time, the uh, promotion agency. And um, that's what I was doing at the, at the time. I was um, recording a reggae album, I think. <laughs> so I'm not really doing anything. I'll come across here, yes. and that was it. He's quite an extraordinary bloke, really, Mac. He's. Um a real sort of extrovert, full of himself. Uh, he's like the best on stage. He's got so much charisma. He's a great front man. He's the best front man we've ever had. You know, he really gets the crowd going and everything. That's I think that's a real important thing for a singer to have. Um, he's um, he's very uh, what can I say? He's just very uh, extrovert and uh, an amazing character. And he's he's always uh, he's always got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetical saw more changes. Johan joined full time and a new label. We always thought that it would happen one day because GDP are good for progressive rock in England. And we were doing progressive metal, predominantly not in England. And so it always seemed logical that we'd go to Inside Out. Um, we knew the guys who started it up before they started it up and known them for a long time. So they're good friends. And so it was almost a question of when would we go rather than would we go. A successful tour was followed by a live CD. Yeah, it was great. Great fun. We toured with the band called Ark, who were um, all really nice guys and got on really well. Um, and uh, all the gigs went great, you know. I, I remember, I think, Bokken was a brilliant gig there. I really enjoyed that. Oh, really well. I really only heard the other day. So. Yesterday, no, Sunday. So I was really impressed. Let's say, of course, all the vocals are live. <laughs> no overdubs at all. I was pleased the way a lot of the sort of power of the performance comes over, you know, because uh, I thought, you know, the guitars come across really well. Me being a guitar player, of course, that's what I always listen for, and they sound really good, so I was happy, you know. Yeah, yeah. Very much. I don't, uh, normally I don't like listening to live clips, but it was, I was really impressed with it. Okay, it was the last gig of the tour, so I mean, we had to be good by then. So. And now, critical mass. Another step forward? Oh, hugely. I think every time we come here and do an album, we listen back and we think, ah, oh, that's improved by 10% or 20% on last time. With this new one, critical mass, I don't know what the listeners are going to think, but we just had a feeling that we've done more than the 10% this time. We've already jumped 50% up in, in what we've done quality wise. Now Threshold looked to the future and their first gigs outside Europe. You know, I've read so many things about bands being in the States and playing over there and, you know, what the, the audience reaction's like. And you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see, seeing what it's going to be uh, going to be like playing in front of them. I'm sure it'll be great. Well, you know, that's a, another dream come true, really. We say that you've been in a band unless you've toured the States, you know, one gig. It's good enough for me.